the, the rapid growth of debt is itself in itself inflationary because if we we're getting to a point where the government has to issue more debt just to pay the interest on the existing debt because interest rates are going up it opens the door to a debt spiral and i don't i don't say that lightly i mean for for a long time you'd sound you know like an idiot to suggest the united states would ever get into a debt debt spiral but you know ray dalio talked about it last week this country's headed for a debt crisis is what he, he told cnbc last week a few months ago larry um uh, I think it was Larry Lindsay said that uh, you know the risk of a debt spiral in the United States is is significant, and so when you have a former Treasury Secretary, you know these types of people talking about this, all these things point to longer term secular inflationary forces that are that don't go away very easily and, and are probably uh, very likely beyond the Fed's control. On this episode of the What the Finance podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming on Jesse Felder, who's the founder of Felder Investment Research and host of Super Investors. So Jesse, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Hey, thanks for having me here. No problem. And I'm looking forward to our conversation because, uh, yeah, a lot's been happening in the markets at the moment. It seems to be a lot of volatility. Everyone has their own opinions. And I feel like there's sort of two camps of what everyone thinks is, is going to happen. So I'm interested to hear your opinion about what you're currently seeing in the markets and what's happening in the economy in general. Well, for, for months now, I guess a few months ago, early in the summer, I wrote a piece to for my readers uh, just titled the, the Most Important Chart in the World. And I was specifically talking about the weekly chart of the 10-year Treasury yield, um, because it looked to me like it was forming a kind of a bullish flag pattern, which, you know, in, in technical analysis is just a, a classic kind of consolidation move in the middle of a, of a longer term uptrend. So you get a, a strong up move. Kind of this sideways corrective uh, bullish flag pattern, and then it breaks out higher and 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 moves in another strong upward move. And <clears throat> that technical pattern was interesting to me because it was confirming uh, everything that I was reading from some of the smartest kind of watchers of money markets in the world. I think since the very beginning of the war, uh, of the year, uh, Bill Dudley, former head of the New York Fed, has been worry uh, warning, writing you know for Bloomberg. These pieces warning about turbulence in the treasury market, basically saying that the supply of treasuries is is overwhelming the natural demand for them. So with the Fed stepping out of the market, engaging quantitative tightening, that puts a lot of pressure on the prices of treasury securities, meaning probably higher interest rates. It was interesting to me that you have the, this former head of the New York Fed, who probably understands the money markets better than 99% of the finance population out there. And then the founder of the largest hedge fund on the planet, Ray Dalio, saying the same thing, um, that you know interest rates are probably headed higher because there's just a supply-demand mismatch in the market. So I, I think this is far and away the most important topic uh, in, in the world of finance right now is, is these long-term interest rates. We've had this, this Fed tightening cycle for about you know a little over a year now that really kind of created a tightness on the, in higher interest rates on the short end. But now the long end is really starting to follow through. And that's something that I think uh, not a lot of people are anticipating and has important ramifications across a lot of different markets. Yes, I guess for a lot of people, they'll say, oh, well, you know, the US has always had ridiculous amounts of debt. You know, they've had a large fiscal deficit for quite a while now. So why, why is it now that this is going to be an issue? Is it just the perfect storm of all, all the, what are the factors that you're thinking will influence that? Yeah, I think it's just that supply demand. I think if you look at the last 10 plus years, really since the great financial crisis, the US fiscal debt to GDP has gone up at the same rate as the, the Fed's balance sheet to GDP. So to me, that's a sign that we've been engaged in, uh, you know, uh, monetizing the debt already for, for a prolonged period of time. Ben Bernanke famously said when he was testifying in Congress in 2011, maybe not so famous, this should be more famous. Um, he was asked why, you know, by a congressperson, why isn't this monetizing the debt? Why, if you're engaging in quantitative easing and the Fed is buying treasuries, why is this not monetizing the debt? And his answer was very important. He said this, you know, this is back in 2011. He said, the reason this isn't monetizing is because we will normalize the balance sheet in, you know, within the next few years. So we're going to be printing money to buy the debt. And then we're going to let that run off. And we're going to normalize the balance sheet within a couple of years. Obviously, here we are more than 10 years later, 
and the balance sheet has gone in the other direction. It's it's many multiples of what it was in 2011. And so to me, that's evidenced by Bernanke's definition that this has been monetizing the debt. And so what quantitative easing has accomplished, it hasn't been a terrific booster of the of an economic activity in the way the Fed hoped, but it's enabled government debt to grow in a way that uh, it, it otherwise would have been able to do. So, you know, barring quantitative easing, we might have run into these interest rate problems sooner and the government might have, you know, uh, you know, historically, we've talked about the bond vigilantes, right? When the fiscal authority gets out of control, interest rates go up, bond vigilantes, you know, come into to play and, uh, you know, the fiscal ha has to get its house in order. What quantitative easing did was it it uh, interrupted that mechanism, that market mechanism. And so I think we're at the point now where government debt has gotten so large, debt, debt to GDP. And in fact, it hasn't been very, very large for a long time. The debt to GDP levels now are the highest since World War II in the United States. And so it's really only ever been that high back then. And so now for the Fed to be trying to step away from the market at the same time as debt levels are so huge and growing relative to GDP, it creates this supply demand mismatch or has as uh, Bridgewater has talked about is Ray Dalio's, you know, former firm, they call it a liquidity hole, where there's just, you know, the Fed stepping away from the treasury market when there's all of this treasury issuance creates a big hole in the markets. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, for like sort of the first part of this year, the yields actually stay quite low, especially for the longer term, there's sort of been this inverted yield. Uh, be because of the thought that, you know, something's going to crash, the Fed are going to have to pivot. Also, potentially, there was that they weren't really issuing many of those longer dated bonds, as you're saying. Uh, it was more sort of on the short end. But now with the resupply of the treasuries, uh, sort of, I guess, bank account, that, that that's changed. So is it just all these factors coming into play, as well as a lot of the things that you mentioned there, where, uh, you know, the Fed have basically, it's the Fed <laughs> walking away from the market in the short term? Yeah, and and actually, you you make a good point too because earlier in the year we ran into you know the debt ceiling, and so the treasury was forced to run down the treasury general account to essentially nothing, and so that lack of debt issuance, uh, you know, really delayed the onset of or the appearance of this liquidity hole until the debt ceiling issue was resolved, and now the treasury has said okay, we need to not just refill the treasury general account, essentially the working working account for the treasury. We also have tons of uh, debt to issue to just, you know, uh, make up the, the the fiscal deficit. So um, I, I think it's it's a lot of those dynamics. So once, once the debt ceiling was resolved, you know, that created, uh, you know, allowed the treasury to start issuing at the same time as the Fed is continuing to try and, and, and quantitatively tighten I think you know the the other interesting thing uh, too is that you know, the inflation dynamics you know have been going on during this period too is that we we ran into the year over year peak in interest rates essentially I think it was July was the peak in 2022 for for most you know inflation measures and so the year over year comparisons looked pretty good until that July peak but now uh, now we're running into tougher comparisons and so it looks like a lot of the year over year numbers are not coming down as fast as people hope. So at the same time, you have this liquidity hole, you're having this dynamic potentially where inflation numbers aren't improving to the in the way that maybe a lot of people expected. And so if you have nominal GDP growth that's surprising to the upside and inflation surprising to the upside, along with the massive issuance of treasuries, it's not hard to understand what you know what's driving this these markets. Yeah, do you think there's a way that we could see this disconnect between the yield and interest rates, or is it just going to be the Fed sort of coming in and and saving the market? What What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I think the Fed will probably have to come back in. Um, you know, I think much like we saw with you know the Bank of England a, uh, a year ago, uh, when the the market for sovereign debt becomes you know unhinged it's kind of incumbent upon the central bank to do something about it. Now, I think the, the real problem with this is that everybody knows inflation has not yet been brought back to the Fed's target. So for them to reverse quantitative tightening now potentially opens up a much bigger inflation problem. So I don't know what the, the hurdle is going to be for, for Jay Powell and company at the, at the Fed. 
but because you know it's it's got to be pretty high because for them to to reverse course here with the balance sheet um, potentially opens up a, the door to a much bigger inflation problem in terms of inflation psychology and, and a lot of things which are already showing signs of being a problem. So you know it's a, it's a really interesting time and it's and I think for for you know uh, for everybody involved this you know I don't think there's anybody operating in markets today who's experienced anything like this. Um, and so it's, you know, I think it requires a lot of um, humility to, you know, think about what do these things mean? How do they play out? Um, because this is this is something new. Yeah, at, least, so that, at least in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, let, let's say there were to be this liquidity, uh, I guess, vacuum. There was enough liquidity mm -hmm. in the long end. You know, yields continue to have to increase to sort of fill up the the gap from what I can imagine there, there'd be a massive increase in the value of the dollar. So it's sort of the dollar wrecking ball and steroids. Is that something that you, you see could happen? And then I imagine that would be quite detrimental for the global well, economy. You, you would, you would think so. I, you know, I'm not a dollar bull <clears throat> longer term. The dollar typically tracks the, the long, the trends in the dollar track the trends in the fiscal deficit. So deficit widens, dollar goes down. You look at a you know multi-decade chart of the dollar and the deficit, and they track very closely, right? So, the the last you know real major peak in, in the dollar was back in the early two thousands, um, when we actually had a, a short term fiscal surplus um, in the in the late nineties. You know there were a lot of capital gains taxes and stuff paid during the nineteen ninety nine dot com bubble and all that stuff and. But from that point, from that fiscal surplus, deficits were on a widening trend. Dollar peaked in 2001 or two, rolled over into a major, major, um, you know, bear market that ended around the time of the great financial crisis when deficits blew out to the, the widest we'd seen in a long, long time. So I think from a longer term trend, and th those are what are most important to me from even from a trading perspective, I kind of want to be aligned with longer term trends. I think this widening deficit is dollar bearish. Now you're right. If if rates are going to just go to the moon and the Fed is going to allow them to and not step into the market, that would be very dollar bullish. But if the Fed is forced to step into the treasury market, uh, right, that's very dollar bearish, I think, for them to come in and say, okay, we can't allow long-term interest rates to go up and adequately compensate people for the risk they're taking. And we're going to open the door to a much bigger inflation problem. Who wants to hold dollars in that environment? I can't imagine. Um, you know, I, I think that that opens the door to the dollar. You know, to to use a, a common um, axiom. You know, it, it really dirties the <laughs> the supposedly cleanest shirt uh, in in the pile uh, a great deal. Yeah, that makes sense. So when you mean that, when you say the dollar is sort of devalued over the last or the peak was in early 2000s. Is that the Dixie? So I guess comparatively against other currencies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm looking at the dollar index. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So, so that's quite interesting. So I guess from your perspective, do you see this being a, is this a secular shift where uh, I guess the last 40 years we've seen interest rates decreasing, uh, you know, yields obviously on bonds decreasing as well, all these other benefits. Are you, do you think it is going to be this quite a large shift and I guess the economy and, uh, and how things work, or is this just going to be a short-term pain to, compensate for yeah a lot of these issues that we've had i i do think we've seen a in a very important secular shift over the last few years and it comes back to inflation i just think that <clears throat> you know the idea it was fascinating to me in 2018 19 we saw several headlines <clears throat> proposing the death of inflation right um everybody thought Inflation and interest interest rates were going to remain low forever because inflation was dead and it's never coming back. Then we had the pandemic and right, I mean, massive money printing and we've seen a huge burst in inflation. And the idea that inflation was going to be transitory was another very important, I think, uh, contrarian signal, very much like the death of inflation was just leading into the pandemic that I think the idea of transitory inflation is so wrong, <laughs> so so blatantly and powerfully wrong that uh, it's 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 almost laughable. 
I think when you look at the forces of secular inflation, right, it's it's all the things people were pointing to suggesting deflation was the order of the day. So it turns out the aging demographics aren't deflationary, they're inflationary. And the, uh, the BIS put out a paper on this actually in 2017, 18, suggesting that a, uh, a shrinking workforce relative to the overall population in every country except for Japan has been inflationary. And that's the experience that we're now having here in the United States and many other countries. And we're seeing that in, in a strong labor market, right? And very strong wage growth and the return of unions and, and labor power and all of these things. And it's really, really hard for inflation to come down when you're seeing things like United Airlines pilots getting a 40% pay raise, UPS drivers getting a 40% pay raise, you know, it suggests that labor after years and years and years of, of suffering due to the growing power of capital is now seeing a major reversal where power is shifting back in labor's favor and disinflationary trends in terms of wages are shifting back. And that goes along with, uh, you know, deglobalization as well. I mean, one of the trends that empowered capital relative to labor was shifting jobs overseas, right? Let's send production to China. We can keep our costs low and, and we can threaten unions. You know, hey, if you guys want to, you know, go on strike, we'll just ship your jobs to Mexico or China or, you know, wherever else we can, we can do it cheaper. Now we have this, we find out the, the real risks of shipping all those jobs and, and hollowing out the manufacturing bases and is, is, are much more serious than we really believed over the last few years. And so now there's this trend towards reshoring and, and uh, you know, of labor. That's very, very inflationary. So you have things like, you know, deglobalization, I think demographics and, you know, all of these things, not to mention, you know, the debt itself, the, the rapid growth of debt is itself in itself inflationary. Because if we, we're getting to a point where the government has to issue more debt just to pay the interest on the existing debt because interest rates are going up, it opens the door to a debt spiral. And I don't, I don't say that lightly. I mean, for, for a long time, you'd sound you know, like an idiot to suggest the United States would ever get into a debt, debt spiral. But you know, Ray Dalio talked about it last week. This country's headed for a debt crisis, is what he, he told CNBC last week. A few months ago, Larry, um, uh, I think it was Larry Lindsay, said that uh, you know, the risk of a debt spiral in the United States is, is significant. And so when you have a former Treasury Secretary, you know, these types of people talking about this, all these things point to longer term secular inflationary forces that, are, that don't go away very easily and, and are probably uh, very likely beyond the Fed's control. And can you please explain like what a debt cycle, is? obviously it's hard to know because we haven't seen many, but what would that look like? <laughs> Well, you know, it essentially means, you know, a, a debt crisis or a debt spiral, you know, is kind of what I was talking about, where interest rates go up because there's too much debt, right? And so debt holders go, okay, there's no way this is going to get paid back, right? At least not in dollars that have the same purchasing power as the ones I'm spending on buying the bonds in the first place. And so this is a bad deal. I don't want to own these bonds. Interest rates, interest rates go up. So that means the interest cost on that debt is also going up dramatically. And if, you know, the, we're already in a fiscal uh, deficit, you know, the biggest fiscal deficit since World War II, essentially, right now, um, that means the government has to sell more debt just to pay the interest on, on that. And so it becomes a cycle where the, the debt, the growth in the debt is growing much more rapidly than the economy. And there's no way to end that without cutting spending, without printing about, you know, a bunch of money to, to uh, you know, pay back the debt, essentially monetizing the debt and cutting spending in a way that creates a very, very painful recession. And so um, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a stagflationary outcome. And I think that's, that's, that's my base case for the next few years is stagflation and, and whatever, you know, form that it, it comes in. But essentially it looks like nominal, strong nominal growth in the economy, but inflation that remains elevated such that, uh, you know, real growth is, is, is minuscule. Yeah. Okay. And I guess the Fed come in and try and keep the yields down, but that won't have a positive impact on, uh, you know, inflation or uh, growth or any of those other factors. It's more just to try and keep the borrowing costs and continue the system as, as it is. 
Yeah, and and I think the Fed's going to be forced to. I don't know what that level is. I mean, the technical target on that bullish flag pattern and the ten-year Treasury yield is somewhere around five percent, you know, a little over five and a quarter percent. And there's long-term um, technical resistance around, you know, five five and a quarter. So I think that it's probably where we're headed in the short run on the ten-year. But if you get, you know, five percent on, you know. Uh, to, on ten-year Treasury, you're talking about you know double-digit interest rates for a lot of corporate America, uh, who took on a massive amount of debt at minuscule interest rates, and so you could have a very painful debt cycle in terms of you know credit issues uh, over the next couple of years. And so, you know, th- these are all things I'm sure that the Fed is is thinking about, and and uh, and and will force them to intervene at some point. Yeah, I agree. So you, you talked about how you think there's going to be a secular shift. I guess globally, this is going to go into the bond market. I'm assuming you think it's also going to impact equities, commodities, and sort of other markets as well. Do you, do you see them sort of shifting in in a similar way, maybe back to the 70s and what we experienced there? Or what, what are you seeing there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of people say, uh, you know, oh, gosh, look at real estate prices in the United States. They're just incredible. They're back to like, you know, the real estate bubble highs. Um, you know, look at oil prices. Oh my gosh. But when you normalize these things in, in any, you know, to like the money supply, look at home prices to M2 ratio. We've had such a huge explosion in the money supply in the last 10 years that real estate prices are actually very, very cheap relative to the growth in the money supply. Now, I'm not saying that's, that's an, you know, a metric you should use to go value real estate as a real estate investor, but I'm just saying it helps understand where how did this happen how did this happen with uh you know prices of everything when you normalize oil prices gas prices by m2 and by inflation they're actually very very low by historical standards the oil price relative to m2 is minuscule so it, then you understand okay why is saudi arabia doing what they're doing you know well we're being paid in massively devalued dollars so a hundred dollar oil today is not a hundred dollar oil from 2008 Right. When, you know, last time we had a major oil price peak, you know, hundred dollar oil in 2008 is like one hundred and eighty dollar oil today or two hundred dollar oil today. So, you know, there's a lot of room, I think, <clears throat> for commodity prices to to rise. And I do think we've we've started, uh, you know, we're in the early innings of a, a secular bull market or a, or a commodity super cycle. Okay. And I guess in, in terms of equities, do you have any thoughts on, on what's happening there? Do you think it's going to be the end of, I guess, this massive overperformance of, of the growth stocks that we've seen and sort of reversion to maybe more value investing and, and uh, focus on short-term cash flows rather than the long-term growth potentials? Yeah, I'm honestly, I'm really worried about the the stock market right now. I, I think that valuations, you know, are such that they need, uh, you know, stocks need uh, interest rates to go back down to the pre-COVID paradigm. We they need to to justify today's valuations. They need inflation and interest rates to go way back down again. Um, if that doesn't happen, and you know, like I said, I mean, what's the catalyst for for a down cycle and you know another resumption of the the bear market that began in 2022? And I think it's the prospect of a painful credit cycle. If you look at you know. Junk spreads are 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 pretty narrow right now, but um, if you think a lot of you know junk companies are going to be paying in the teens for you know interest rates and you know, trying to refinance heading into kind of a maturity wall, uh, you know this is the real risk of higher for longer interest rates. Is that you know companies have been saying okay we we refinanced in 2020 we locked in low interest rates for however long maybe you know five years is I think typical for a lot of corporate maturities. We're now we're going to hold out as long as we can to see if rates come back down to refinance again. If they don't come back down and we're holding off and holding off and holding off, and then you get a widening of spreads, um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, if, if I were a treasurer today, I'd be at least hedging a little bit by trying to issue some debt at the low spreads, even though if they're, they're higher nominal yields. Um, you know, that they're based on. Uh, because if you're waiting to refinance and then spreads blow out and all that kind of stuff, I mean, you're you're gambling the company's future on on a uh, interest rate bet. 
And I think we're probably headed towards a time where spreads are going to start to widen as we get closer to a kind of a corporate maturity wall and companies have to start refinancing. And, and people think, okay, maybe that only affects the highly leveraged companies. But no, no, when you get a credit cycle, that means recession, that means all these things, and it affects all of the, the big tech companies too, right? I mean, all Microsoft's customers buying office products and whatever, you know, you're going to see a lot of those go bankrupt you know that, that's going to hurt their top line and, and bottom line too so so i think we're we're probably headed towards a a significant um you know problem for for corporate credit uh and and uh you know that that's not good for the equity market uh, at all yeah it sounds like if, if we look at sort of what we've talked about in the bond market and the equity market it could be another down year for the 60 40 and potentially it's a yeah, a shift away from, I guess, that standard portfolio that was, has been the, you know, bellwether for the last 40 years. Yeah. And, you know, I think if you are a 60, 40 investor, you have to understand I'm a hundred percent invested in financial assets, right? That's a great trade when financial assets are benefiting from disinflationary forces, right? Why have they done so well? Well, interest rates peaked in the, in the, uh, you know, early 1980s. And you could have bought long-term bonds or stocks. I mean, we're both a great, it was a wonderful time to buy financial assets. It was also a wonderful time to sell real assets, gold, oil, you know, commodities, et cetera. And, you know, when Paul Volcker finally broke the back of inflation, we entered this long disinflationary period. Uh, was It's been a wonderful time for 40 plus years to, to you know, to, to own financial assets. But if now we've seen a secular shift, uh, a sea change, as you know, uh, Howard Marks, you know, wrote, called it um, in a PC wrote for Financial Times a few months ago. If we have seen a sea change in interest rates and inflation and these things, then you better own some non-financial assets. You better have some be diversified into some some type of real assets, and that's you know, commodities, tips, precious metals, real estate, etc. Yeah, so I guess depending on the person, it's not withdrawing completely from them. It's just more continued diversification of what they currently have. Yeah, I don't think anybody, um, you know, should really try and and you know bet massively on on, on any of these things because as soon as you do, right, then you get get a pullback in in the oil price or pullback in you know like we're seeing right now in precious metals. Um, right now, as as soon as you go all in on them, that's kind of just how that works. And so I think it is. It is important to you know diversify across a lot of these things, and and that's kind of what I try to do in in my research and, and my writing is okay. Well, let's underweight you know financial assets and let's overweight real assets, and and understand that you know it's probably better to kind of buy dips in in real assets and you know sell rallies in financial assets and just kind of have that general mindset rather than go all in on you know one thing and, and cut every the other thing out completely. Although I have no exposure to bonds right now I'm in, and don't really want any right now. Yeah, uh, it's great, crazy market. So if we, yeah, you mentioned there that that's sort of what, what you're thinking. So are, are those the key assets that you think, I guess, are going to perform well, the real assets, then you think probably the those more financial assets are going to perform poorly, I guess, at least in the short term? Yeah, I mean, I think right now is just a an incredible buying opportunity in the precious metal space. We saw, you know, this this steep sell off related to rising interest rates. But as I said, you know, that in the short run right now, it appears to be, you know, dollar bullish. Uh, but the closer we get to the Fed having to intervene, the more and more that that becomes very dollar bearish and very bullish for, for precious metals and commodities and things, because the Fed stepping in and opening the door to a bigger inflation problem means investors are going to say, wait a second. I don't, none of us actually have enough gold to, to uh, hedge against those types of scenarios that, 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 you know, will be opened uh, in, in that kind of uh, happening. So I, I think it's, yeah, I, I think sentiment is extremely bearish towards the precious metals right now. I think we've seen the daily sentiment index is something I track in single digits for gold for several days, the first time since October a year ago, which was a pretty good buying opportunity. We also just got a McClellan buy signal in, in GLD, which is the gold ETF, which is essentially just, um, it gets oversold on RSI on the daily chart. And the five-day rate of change drops below negative two and a half percent. These don't always work, but when you 
kind of pair them with a, a really deeply negative sentiment reason. A lot of times the, the technical buy signal and the really bare sentiment set up a, uh, a good opportunity to, to take the other side. Yeah, it's interesting. So Jesse, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, my last question is, what is one message you'd like people to take away from our conversation? What is my takeaway from, from this conversation? Um, well, I, I enjoyed it. You're a great interviewer. So thanks for, thanks for having me on. I love the title of the podcast, you know, what the finance it's uh, it's perfect for it. It's perfect for these markets, right? Because that's a lot of times I'm looking at different charts and going, what the F is going on here. Um, so yeah, no, this is, this has been a lot of fun, Anthony. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I was sort of more meaning like if someone were to say, say one message that they should take away oh, from one, one takeaway. Yeah, yeah. One takeaway. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's that um, what, what has worked in my opinion, what has worked over the last 10, 20, 30 years is not going to work over the next three, five, five, 10 years. We're, we have seen uh, a secular shift and you have to change your mindset in looking at things that work in a, in a different type of environment because the the, the land, the, the ground underneath us has shifted in a seismic way and you have to pay attention to that. Great message. So thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. So if anyone wanted to find out more about your work and what you do, where would the best places for that be? So um, I... I put up a, a weekly blog post at the felderreport.com. I, you know, I do lots of reading and research and charts and stuff. And so uh, once a week, I kind of put together the five um, charts or links or whatever that I, that I found during the week that I thought were most important. I've been trying to kind of pull those together into, into a theme lately. Um, but yeah, that's just a weekly blog post. And that goes out in a weekly email too, that you can sign up for on my website. Um, and then I'm probably too active on on twitter or what was formerly known as <laughs> twitter now x uh i i tweet out a lot of um you know stuff that i'm reading and charts that i find interesting and that's just at jesse felder i'll put that in the description below but thanks again for your time thanks anthony thank you so much for listening and if you enjoyed the episode please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released i hope you're leaving with some great value about investing trading and finance see you on the next show